Next, and if we finish quick, we'll go to Lamb. Uh, all right. Um, today is a midterm. Or I'm sorry. <laughs> today is the review for the midterm. I inadvertently, I hope I didn't inadvertently startle anyone, but today's a review for the midterm, not the midterm itself. The midterm you have from, well, why rely on my memory? Let's look it up. Uh, you know, even if I showed them, you know, there's like, you know, there's like, you know, 125 questions, so it'd be real hard for you to, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the midterm is, is worth 20 points. Um, it, it is divided evenly, 10 points between um, what I would call short answer, um, no multiple choice or anything, but short answer is, you know, anywhere from a couple of sentences to a short paragraph uh, along that line. Um, definitely not one word answers, or at least I hope not. Uh, on the other hand, you don't have to write paragraphs and paragraphs about it. One well-written paragraph probably would answer um, the questions adequately. Um, at any rate, the midterm will be available starting tomorrow, all right, maybe like midnight tonight, uh, you know, tomorrow, or definitely by tomorrow morning, early tomorrow morning, eight-ish or so. Um, <laughs> Probably depends on when I go to bed tonight, all right? But at any rate, the midterm will be available tomorrow through 1024. That's almost a week's time, all right? Um, there'll be no class Thursday evening, the 20th, all right? In, in my mind, that's my compensation to you for having to take two hours of your own time to take this midterm online as opposed to delivering it then, all right? You will have uh, two and a half hours to take the test. It must be done in one sitting. Uh, there'll be a written part and a hands-on in access. And what we're going to do now is review the study guide and see what questions you have, anything you want me to go over, and so on. Again, 10 questions would be um, short answer, which again is, is like a good, a good well-written paragraph in most cases should do it. Now, I don't grade based on the number of words that you've used, so you don't get points for extra words, all right? Make sure you've answered the question completely, I guess is my one piece of advice. If I were to say, give two reasons why you might, this, this would be a, a, an example question. Of course, now you know that um, this question isn't going to be on the test, at least not worded this way. But maybe something like, if, uh, you know, which would you choose to be primary key if you had a choice of employee number or social security number. Employee numbers are five digits long. Social security numbers are nine digits long. Which would you choose and why? All right. Um, be sure you answer which you would choose and then give the reason why. A lot of times students with those questions that kind of have two implied parts will answer part of it and not the other. Or if I say, give two advantages to using relational databases over sequential files. All right? Make sure you have first advantage is this, second advantage is this. So don't just give one advantage and write a book about it. Make sure you answer the question completely. That's the one thing that is um, um, frustrating for me grading because believe it or not, Instructors want to give you points for your answer. We want to see that you've learned the material. And unfortunately, we can't give a grade based on what we think that you understand. We have to give a grade based on what you have demonstrated that you've understood. So a lot of times people will have great answers, but if they don't completely answer the question, I have to take some points off. I do believe in part credit. So um, 
if you get, you know, it, you know, you're liable to get, I probably won't break it down any more than quarters, you know, uh, the first, uh, the first 10 questions are each worth 10 points, or one, I'm sorry, they're each worth one point each for a total of 10 points. So I might give a half point or three quarters of a point or a quarter point. I won't break it down any further than that. You, you know, you got um, five sixteenth of a point. <laughs> I, don't, I can't distinguish that. I can, I can tell if you're right, I can tell if you're wrong, and then I think I can tell three grades in between. You know, you're closer to being right than wrong, you're closer to wrong than being right, or you're smack dab in the middle. I think I can tell those three uh, gradations of, of right and wrong. So answer the questions completely, I, I guess is it. The second part of it is um, about seven little tasks that you need to perform on an access database. All right. So I may say create a table, create such and such relationship, uh, create a form that does such and such. Create a report that does such and such. The idea here is I'm not going to be asking sort of curveball kind of oddball things. I'm going to be asking the things that are sort of like the stuff that's on the assignment. And if you've been creating forms on the assignment, um, you know, you'll, you'll be in good shape as far as that goes. Um, that part of it, I more or less will tell you what to do. You don't have to come up with the database design for that part of it. All right. I'll say create a table that does this, create a table that does that, uh, make such and such the primary key, create a foreign key. So it's really a mechanical thing just to make sure that you're familiar with access. Remember, part of the test is the timing factor. All right. That my hope is that you're familiar enough with it that you know, you don't have to go and research every single little activity because if you do that, you'll run out of time. All right. The written part will consist largely of some of the conceptual and definition kind of things with uh, questions as far as database design. Um, let's look at the uh, study guide and uh, review some of these points and maybe I'll give some examples of what maybe some questions would look like. Here's in a nutshell the two portions of it. Let me make the, let me zoom it a bit. That should be good. All right, blah, 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 blah. If you don't think you can get the, t the, 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 the test done within the period of time that you're allotted, that is from the, the, the what, the 20th to the, or the 19th through the 24th. If you can't get it done or you don't expect to be able to get it done within, let me know as soon as possible. All right. Otherwise, the expectation is by the end of that day, all the midterms will be, will be turned in. Again, they're all open-ended questions. Um, here's for the written part. Here's for the hands-on part. Most important topics for the written part. Database definition. Again, the one thing I mentioned before is my aim is to ask questions that you can't simply Google, right? So I'm not going to say what's the definition of a database because you could Google that and, and, and uh, find the answer. Yet, you should know what the definition of a database is and know what a database is made up of and some of the questions that I give might test whether you know that or not. For example, to explain the difference between a database and a flat file. That's not exactly the same as asking for the definition of the database. Or, especially when we get into part two, the advantages and disadvantages of the use of database. Compare using a database for storing data with other file processing systems. What do you gain? What do you lose? What are the respective advantages and disadvantages of both technologies? Um, to be sure, the disadvantages of relational databases are relatively small compared to the advantages. That's why most applications these days are built on top of databases. All right. Yet, there are still some, I guess you'd call them drawbacks or considerations might be better put. 
data versus information, and that refers to the Walmart article, uh, or, or that also goes along with the Walmart article that we read about how, um, again, the difference, what it means when an IT person talks about data versus information. How do you take data and transform it into information? What is the significance of that to the organization to be able to do that? All right. Tables, columns, primary keys, and foreign keys. You know, again, not asking for definitions to write them out, but you need to understand these so that if I ask a question about them, you'll be conversant in it. Why do we make foreign keys? What makes for a good primary key? What are the requirements of a primary key? If you had two choices of a primary key, which one would you pick and why? All right. Relationships and implementing. Referential integrity, normalization. All of those things sort of go together, right? They're related to database design. And there will likely be a number of questions that relate, about, relate to database design. Now, you won't necessarily have to develop a database from scratch. But what I might do is I might show you a couple tables one thing I might do is show you a table and ask you what's wrong with it. For example, I might say something like this. Here's a student table. I might say this. Here's a student table that has a student ID, the first name, last name, email address, class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4. Then ask you what's wrong with that table and how would you fix it. All right. Um, let me try to play with the lighting so that we can see this a little better. What is wrong with that table, by the way? Okay, that's a good way to put it. We have two entities in one table. What's another way to put that? What's another way to say the same thing? Yeah, that this class has a problem that the most classes that a student could be enrolled in is four. All right? That it's two ways of saying the same thing, right? But it's obvious to me that both students that gave their answers, even though they worded it differently, all right, understand what's wrong here. Uh, another way to say it is that this violates one of the normalization rules insofar as there are repeating fields, all right? You should not have a set of repeating fields, a repeating field or a set of repeating fields in a table. And why not? Well, the downside, at most, the student could only have four classes. Another way to put it is there's sort of another entity hiding in there. All right? Now, what would you do to fix this? Well, you'd probably do something like this. You'd probably have a student table that would have this stuff in it. You'd have a class table that would have class ID and the other info about the class. And then you'd have a student class table that would be an intersecting table between those two. So again, that is a very typical sort of question I might ask about database design. And again, you can sort of fit that in any of those categories, tables, columns, primary keys, relationships, normalization, uh, and all that. Uh, another example might be something like, let's say, I have a faculty table 
that has a faculty ID, faculty name, etc. Then a department table that has a department ID, department name, etc. I might say that, well, a faculty person belongs to only one department and each department can have more than one faculty person. How would you implement that? All right, how would you implement that? And you'd implement it by having a department ID as a foreign key in the faculty table. I'll tell you, that's one common mistake I see for students, both in their assignments and on exams and, uh, and so on, is sort of reversing the one-to-many relationship. All right? Uh, some students would say, well, I'll put a faculty ID in the department because there's a relationship. No. Remember, the many side always points to the one side. So if it's one to many between department and faculty, the many side, the faculty side, can point to the one side for department. So those are the kinds of questions I would ask. You're not going to build a database from the ground up, but I'll give you scenarios of maybe partly built tables or incorrectly built tables or gee they got it wrong a faculty person doesn't belong to just one department maybe they belong to two departments or multiple departments how would you change it then you know so I'd, I'll pose these sort of things based on some small set of tables and you need to document what your answer would be my suggestion for documenting the answer would be the notation that I've kind of used and I think the book uses where they put the table name and put an asterisk next to the primary key and so on and then I think a double asterisk next to any foreign key problems created when tables are not normalized yeah redundant data is that. Do be careful. A lot of times students yell redundant data even when there's some other issue. But truly violating the normalization rules um, really leads to redundant data. For example, if you had a professor's office associated with every student that that professor advises, then that piece of data is stored many times. All right. Remember, it's okay to have a key stored as a foreign key. You need to do that to create the relationship. But that's the only way that you relate two tables together is via the key. All right. Uh, any other field should not be in the related table. Um, strong and weak entities. We talked a little bit about that in the last couple of weeks, the difference between the two. All right. Cascading deletes. This is a case of where I think and you, you may disagree. Uh, I think um, this is where a multiple choice uh, question could be deceiving. Because I said before, I'm not just going to ask you, should you cascade this delete? I may ask you, why would you cascade the delete? And it's potentially that you could, you could give a very good reason and have a different answer than me. You know, I might say, yeah, I would go and cascade that delete, but maybe you come up with some reasoning that I acknowledge is good reasoning, and I can see it from that perspective. So even if you get a different answer than I would have given, I'm, I can still give you credit if you give a good reason. But what I will do is I'll describe a situation, and I'll say, should you cascade the delete, and um, why? Yes? When you cascade deletes, does it cascade both ways? Yeah. That, that, is, that is a great question. The question is, is when you cascade a delete, does it delete both ways? And the answer is no. All right. Very common mistake people make on the midterm and, and, and the exam, in fact, is either thinking it goes both ways or analyzing it in the opposite direction. All right. A cascading delete always goes from the parent down to the child. And when, when I talk about parent and child, I mean... I'm defining the parent as being on the one side of the relationship, the child as being on the multiple. So, let's put some actual tables here. Let's say we have a department 
having a relationship with professor. All right. So in the department table, there'd be a department ID, the name of the department, maybe some other attributes. In the professor table, there'll be a professor ID as a primary key, other attributes, and there will be a department ID as a foreign key. The cascading delete only works from if I delete the department, will I delete the professor? There's no implication as far as uh, cascading deletes for this relationship anyhow between professor and department. So I can delete a professor and if, if these were say the only two tables in my database, I could delete a professor, it doesn't matter what's out there for department. However, the question for cascading delete says, if I delete a department, do I delete all the professors associated with that department? So it goes from the parent to the child. It always goes just in that direction. Let's take a step back and, and consider why that's an issue. You know, let's say, let's look at some sample data. Let's say department ID of one is the business division. Department idea of two, uh, idea of two is arts and humanities, and so on. That's in the department table. In the professor table, I may have Professor One, Zellers, who's in the business division. Professor Two, Lewis, that's in arts and humanities, and so on. All right. The reason for cascading or restricting the key is because we don't want a violation of referential integrity, right? If, if, assuming these are the only two tables, let's say in a database, if I delete Zellers, would that constitute relation, uh, uh, an issue with referential integrity? No. Zellers is gone. Nothing points to Zellers, all right? Therefore, it's not an issue if Zellers is gone. Boy, that sounds depressing. All right. <laughs> but from a database perspective, since there's nothing that Zellers is the parent of in this database table, then if that row is removed, there's nothing out there that, that is going to violate referential integrity. If we look in the other direction, let's say we were able to delete the business division. All right. If we were able to delete the business division, then Zellers would be out there with a non-existent division. That can't stand, right? That, that can't stay like that, all right? That would be a violation of referential integrity, right? Because Zellers would point to a department that didn't exist, and we can't have that. So the database won't let that. So we have two choices. At least in access, we have two choices. One choice is to cascade delete, which means if you delete the business division, it's also going to delete every professor that's associated with the business division. That way, there's no violation of referential integrity. There's no uh, faculty members out there with non-existent divisions. So the one option is to restrict delete. The second option, is, I'm sorry, the one option is to cascade delete. The second option is to restrict delete where you just say, well, hey, if there's professors out there for this department, you're not allowed to delete that department. All right? In which case, you'd have to do something like delete the, uh, the professors individually or reassign them to other departments or whatever, and then you could go and delete the department. So again, when you keep in mind the purpose of this is to make sure that referential integrity holds, then it's always a case that deleting this, will it cascade to delete these? Never works the other way around. But that's a great question. Characteristics of a good key. All right, we, we spent some time talking about that and we and sort of related to this as candidate keys. Um, subtypes, we talked about what a uh, entity subtype is. 
And the one thing that we didn't talk about, and I am not sure if there's any questions on there or not, I believe it's discussed in the textbook, which means it's fair game, but I will talk about it now, and that is denormalization. Denormalization is when you have a situation where you've normalized your database, but for some reason, and typically the reason is performance related, you choose to denormalize the database. So you choose to uh, maybe put totals in your customer table. All right? If you had something like this, if you had customers placing orders, the orders having line items uh, associated with them, and the line items being associated with products. That's a bunch of tables to go through if you wanted to, to calculate maybe like the total amount that a customer purchased over, uh, over a period of time. All right? Now, normalize, that's a way to do it. However, all right, however, what denormalization says is if there's some sort of external situation like the performance of a normalized database is horrible, then you can do things like, for example, put maybe a total year-to-date purchases here. All right? And then what you can do is you can, you can run queries and reports off of that field instead of going through all the tables to summing it up. Now, doesn't that defeat the purpose of everything we learn? No. In more advanced databases, there are things called stored procedures and triggers that can help keep that redundant data synced up right so that the total year-to-date purchases match the totals of all these tables. All right? And in addition, denormalization isn't something that should be done lightly. You know, If I talk about denormalization, uh, don't think that that's licensed to not normalize your databases. All right. What denormalization is, is, is an acknowledgement that you know, we live in an imperfect world and sometimes if you do everything by the book and follow theoretically the best solution, that in practice that solution might not be workable all right, because of time constraints or uh, performance constraints or whatever. And therefore you very carefully denormalizing it. The analogy I give is like this. All right? And this doesn't work for everyone. I guess it depends on your driving habits. All right? But the speed limit is the speed limit. Right? That's the law. That's how fast you should be going. However, if I was rushing my wife to the hospital having a baby, all right, I don't think anyone's going to begrudge me if I go 40 in a 35 zone. Right? So, okay, I, I sped. But I didn't just do it because, hey, I'm late for American Idol tonight or something like that. I did it for a solid good reason. I knew the consequences. I knew the law. I'm not ignoring the law. I just know that in this particular case, there's special circumstances that warrant me not paying attention to it. And that's the same idea with denormalization. Um, the hands-on part will be similar to a lab assignment. You'll create um, a database uh, based on my specifications, define keys, relationships, be able to add data into it, create simple forms and simple reports, and then finally create a little bit more advanced forms. We probably spent more time talking about forms and reports, so you'll, you, you may have to create more advanced forms. What I mean by more advanced forms are forms with subforms, um, forms with combo boxes. I have tabs here. We did not talk about tabs, so you will not be asked to do that. All right. Um, I forgot that I had tabs written on the, on the review sheet. So you don't have to worry about tabs. We can actually talk about tabs uh, um, early on in the second half of the class. It's actually something pretty neat in Access that you can do pretty quickly. If you have a form that has a bunch of subforms, you can actually create tabs so you can kind of tab through and see all the information. Questions over any of this? Yes? Um, when you have a form with a subform, mm -hmm. could you show us a way to edit the subform in a new window? 
Yeah, let, let's, let's look at that. It, it's tricky, I will say that. But it can be done. I'll tell you what, for good measure, we'll do that and we will put a drop down on the subform just because everyone could always use practice with drop downs. Okay, let me take a second to remember what's in this database. Let's create a form that will show, if you remember this is the, the automobile database. Let's create a form that will show a branch on the top and underneath it will show all the automobiles for that branch. Alright, so let's go in and I can create a form for the branch. Weird. Oh. Create a form for the branch. I had the wrong thing selected. All right. Now, what you want to do when you do this is even if it gives you a subform like that, you want to get rid of that because you're very limited to what you can change about it. So, what I do is, is go into design view and right off the bat you can't really edit that. All right, You can't really edit the subform that it creates for you. So I don't like that so I delete it and add my own subform. All right so I'll go and add my subform. I want to use existing tables and queries. I want to pull from the automobile field, or table rather, and I'll pick the VIN number, VIN number, state plate, model, let's say, model ID. Click next. This is important because this um, tells Access how to match up the, the rows on the main form with the subform. Now in this case we have two options because Access sees that there's two fields that these have in common. They have the branch ID in common which is a foreign key which is the correct option but they also coincidentally have a state in common. Right? The branch has a state and the car has a state for its license plate. So therefore it uh, doesn't know for sure and it thinks hmm, maybe that's the way you match these up. So you need to pick the right one which in this case is using the branch ID. All right, and then we can go in and view the form and we can see all the cars for that branch. Now to your question of editing it in its own window. If we go into design view, this is where it's a little touchy. You got to sort of click right on the border there and if you right mouse there, there's subform in new window. And then you can go in and you can go and edit that. What I'll do is I'll edit that to add a drop down for model. So I'll delete the model ID. I'll add a combo box. For model. And 
And again, one of the things that people often get confused about, they forget that they need to go and store that field somewhere and we want to store it in the automobile's model ID. So we're looking it up from the model table and we're storing it in the automobile's model ID. So we go and save that and now we can go and view it and again we have a drop down for the model of that car. But to answer your question again, you get in the design view and you kind of right on the edge go and click and subform uh, in new window. You can only do that with the subform you create. When it sort of creates that little, it's not even really a subform, it shows this table, then you can't go and do that, which is again an advantage, a, a disadvantage of, of doing that um, and an advantage of creating your own. Other questions? Characteristics of a good key. All right, good question. Anyone care to contribute? Well, we talked about using this short of a key. As okay. Possible, and a number being right. Better. Right. Number better than than alpha alphanumeric. Shorter better than longer. Yeah. First of all, be absolutely sure that it is a good primary key. That that it is a valid primary key. Unique and every row has one, all right? And then lastly, I would say unchanging is better than changing frequently, all right? So, um, for example, um, if we were picking email addresses as a key, as opposed to employee number, all right? Um, it's conceivable that my email address could change, you know. They may go, here at LC, your email address is your first letter of your first name plus your um, seven, up to seven digits of your, of your last name. Well, my last name is exactly seven characters, so it works out good. But for people who have longer last names, their, their last name gets truncated which I think is goofy, right? But anyhow, at some point they may change that policy and say, you know what, uh, you know, someone has a really long last name, let's let them have their full last name instead of cutting it off at seven characters. Well, at that point their email address may change. So, to summarize, all right, first of all, be absolutely sure that it is suitable for a primary key. That is, it's unique and every member of the entity has a value for it. You can't have a null primary key or part of a primary key. The other one, uh, the other thing I would say is numeric over alphanumeric, short instead of long, unchanging instead of changing, and I prefer single part to multiple part. That's, that's another catch I guess in there as well. So I would say those would be the characteristics. Single part. Um, one row? Uh, no, 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 not one row, but one column. For example, um, let's think of an example here. Intersecting table. Uh, an intersecting table would be one. Uh, I'm trying to think of another example. Um, Okay, um, automobile, all right. Automobile, you could use the license plate and state combination as a primary key, right? Every car has a license plate. Um, license plate is unique. There's no two cars with the same license plate, yet that's a two-part key as opposed to a one-part key because it's not just state and it's not just plate number. It's a combination of state and plate, all right? Uh, in other words, there could be, you know, for a license plate number of ABC123, there could be one in Ohio and one in Michigan. So you need to take both the state and the plate number together. There's other issues with a license plate too, you know, it, it could change, you know. Is it really true that every car has one? And there might be a period of time that it wouldn't, whatever. But playing along with it, that's another 
thing against it. That is probably more of a my bias than an official um, official thing, but I have a feeling a lot of people share that same bias too, you know. But definitely the other ones are, 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 uh, are important as well. Other questions? Going once, twice. You can always email me questions, all right, between now and then. All right, we'll see you over in LAMB.